we're talking about Top Gun Maverick. Welcome to Pop Culture Catechism, conversations about music, movies, and the longings of the human heart. Let's get started. Deep down inside, who doesn't love a warrior? Who doesn't want to be a warrior? I mean, think about it. How many of the heroes of our movies and our books, how many of our politicians and our leaders have been great warriors? And I think especially for men, some part of us desperately wants to fight and bleed and maybe die for a noble cause. Even the Bible is full of heroic warriors, Joshua, Samson, King David, Judas Maccabeus, the list goes on. There's something glorious about someone who is willing to be able to fight and kill and die for the right purpose. But war is also hell. Ask yourself, in the last 100 or 200 years, which part of world history would you want not to repeat itself? Which part would you want not to live through? You're probably thinking of a war right now. And what are Christians and Catholics to think of war and warriors when Jesus said stuff like, turn the other cheek, offer no resistance to one who wrongs you, blessed are the peacemakers. My peace, I live with you. My my peace, I leave with you. My peace, I give you. Now, fortunately, the church gives us some guidance. Today, we're going to look at some famous fictional warrior, Maverick, from the movie Top Gun and its most recent and then its most recent iteration in the sequel, Top Gun Maverick. And we're going to look at these and talk about them from the perspective specifically of what is called the just war tradition and Catholic teaching. Hello, listeners. My name is Mike Tenney. I'm a Catholic speaker and worship leader from Washington, D.C., and I spent over a decade teaching Catholic high school theology and also trying to make it big as a rock star. At night now, I'm blessed to speak to thousands of people each year and lead music at events all over the place and through this show, Pop Culture Catechism. This is Pop Culture Catechism. It is the gospel according to pop music and movies where we look for God's love in the media that you're plugged into. So then when we're done with the show, we can unplug and go out into the real world and live God's God's love and know God's love in a deeper way. And my goal for you by the end of this episode is not only will you have new ways of looking at and a deeper appreciation of the Top Gun movies, but also you'll have some ideas for how to love God, love yourself and the people in your life better and know God's love better in your own life. Special thank you to our patrons who make this show possible through popculturecatechism.com. Come. Now, normally on this show, I have a guest that I have great conversations with, but today I am doing a solo episode. So that's one way that this episode will be a little bit different. There's one other way that this show will be a little bit different is this one might not be quite as practical as some of our other things. We're going to get a little bit into stuff that might be a little philosophical, a little theoretical uh, for some people. Now, many of us are in the military. I'm not, but my father was. I have other family members and friends who are. And so for you, if you're in the military, if you are in the police, if you are in a profession or just a state of life where you sometimes use force or violence, this might be more practical for you, but for others of us, it might be a more intellectual exercise, at least we hope so, um, but you never know when war is coming. So it is worth talking about, so hopefully uh, you find it interesting. It might not be as personal for you as, say, last week's Bridgerton episode, but uh, hopefully you enjoy it and you learn some things as well. All right, so a, a few things about uh, the movie Top Gun. I, I watch both. I watch the, the the old one. I grew up watching the original Top Gun. We taped it off of TV on like a cassette tape, and uh, my mom had like you know stopped the recording during like the, the the sex scenes or whatever, like the steamy scenes. There was only one, but um, we, my brothers and I, just loved watching Top Gun, and it, it was one we watched over and over and over again. And we had posters of like F-18s and F-14s and F-15s on our walls. My dad, who uh, flew helicopters in the army for uh, his whole career, like 40 years, and uh, he would take us to uh, Andrews Air Force Base Air Show, which is a huge air show in the D.C. area every year. And so we would go and we would see the Blue Angels and we would see the Thunderbirds and we would see all these amazing planes. And um, I've even gotten to like to to fly some helicopter simulators uh, with my dad. I've gotten to fly the C-5 simulator with my uncle. So so I grew up in a very military family, very uh, military 
atmosphere. Um, I spent a lot of time on military bases. So um, the, my both my brothers almost went into the military. I think when I was young, I thought about it, but uh, just because I'd watched Top Gun, I thought it'd be cool to fly a 14s, but I never really seriously considered it. But that was a lot of the world in which I grew up. And uh, as I got a little older and learned a little bit more about, first of all, Catholic social teaching, um, but also just more about the world, I started to see things from a little bit different perspective. So that's a little bit of my own background. Now, as I often say on this show, when we're talking about Catholic teaching and Christian teaching in the Bible and what it teaches about moral issues, Jesus gives us a very high bar. He says, be perfect as your heavenly father is perfect in the Sermon on the Mount in, in the Gospel of Matthew. And so, and none of this comes with any sort of condescension or judgment on people who are not attaining these standards, because none of us attain to these standards. Only Christ did. Um, and just like when we, we talk about uh, abortion or sex, or we talk about racism, or we talk about greed or lust or a- any of uh, the things that the church has rules about, it's not any sort of hate on the people that might do these things because we all do some of these things. We're all sinners. We are all in need of God's mercy. Um, you know, my own father fought and killed in Vietnam and I love him with all my heart. Um, so just know if you're out there and you're, you hear some challenging things during this episode that uh, this is not, th- this is meant to help us to think more deeply about our lives and about the way we're living. And it's not meant to heap a whole bunch of shame on if, you know, if you feel like you need to see a priest or go to confession or spend some time in prayer or talk to a wise spiritual mentor or something like that, absolutely go do that. But uh, the purpose of this show is to just help us live more intentional lives, more lives in tune with God and to help us with our relationships with all of those around us, including foreign countries and uh, people that we might come into conflict with even just in the day to day. So with all that out of the way, a couple things about the movie that I just really like Top Gun Maverick. It is uh, just, oh, man, it's beautiful. All the practical effects. They don't use a lot of CGI. It's just like people up in planes. I mean, they use some CGI's, but it's just people in planes, the G forces and the missiles and everything. It is awesome. It is just such a fun movie and seeing the original Top Gun just a, a week or two before seeing Top Gun Maverick, it is really interesting just to, to see some of the themes because, you know, Maverick as a young man, he's kind of like fly boy and uh, he's going to sleep with whatever girl he wants and he's going to, you know, do whatever he wants and fly however he wants and get in fights if he wants to and just kind of do whatever. There's like no, he has no responsibility really. Um, And I feel like in this movie, Maverick has to take responsibility. There's a a few key uh, points that I think are are really interesting. Um, He, so spoilers, by the way, uh, when he gets in with his love interest, the Jennifer Jennifer Connelly character, whose name is uh, escaping me at the moment. um, And they, they finally uh, reconnect and there's an, there's an, off screen love scene, but they, then they show that they've woken up in, in, in bed together. Um, and he, her daughter comes home and he like has to jump out the window and the daughter catches him. And what the daughter says to him is don't break her heart. And it's like, Oh, (laughs) there's consequences to these actions. You know, Maverick going around just kind of having whatever relationship here, whatever relationship there, you know, break her heart, come back and leave and come back that there are real consequences and people are really hurt by these things. Um, And then also his relationship with rooster, who of course is his former um, seatmate, Goose's son, you know, Goose died while in the plane with Maverick in the first movie. And now uh, Rooster is under Maverick's care. So <laughs> there's all sorts of Maverick. There's, there's this whole theme of Maverick dealing with his legacy and the things that he've, he's done. And he's an amazing pilot. Nobody doubts that. And he does things that nobody else can do. But he also leaves kind of a lot of damage in his wake. And so he's looking at that legacy and trying to come to grips with it. So I I think that just kind of on a personal note, I think sometimes we can, we can, uh, we can definitely learn from that. So, all right. Now, 
here's the meat and potatoes. We're going to go through what is called just war theory. A little bit of a background. Now, uh, every episode of this show has patron exclusive content. If you're a patron of this show through popculturecatechism.com, you get uh, patron exclusive content for each episode that nobody else gets, just the patrons. For this episode, I am going to link to... Uh, lectures that I've done on just war theory. It's, it's four or five, 15 to 20 minute lectures that I've used to give to my high school classes on the Christian history of war and fighting and, uh, pacifism and nonviolent resistance. And, uh, I used to do it with my honors senior. So it's, it's like fairly, you know, it's, it's understandable for, for an average person, but it's fairly, fairly high level stuff. So anyway, that will be the patron exclusive content for here. We're going to take the just war theory and we're going to apply it to the Top Gun movies, the first one and mostly the the second one. So if this stuff is like really exciting for you and you really get into it and you're like, whoa, I want to learn more about that, consider becoming a patron because uh, I have lots more <laughs> about this. Uh, this episode will just kind of be a, a quick and dirty overview. So a little bit of history. In the early days of Christianity, Christians were pretty much pacifists. If you learn about the early martyrs, you know, there, there were persecutions under the Romans. The Romans would persecute the Christians and uh, throw them in the Colosseum and they would get eaten by lions and stuff. And when you go to mass, we still ask for the prayers of some of these saints like Felicity and Perpetua. Uh, St. Stephen was, was, an, was an early martyr although not through the Romans, but there were lots of martyrs in the early church and the early Christians took those words of Jesus to turn the other cheek and offer no resistance very, very literally. And St. Paul has a very similar sort of passage um, in, in Romans 12. I'm pretty sure it is. I'm, I'm not as good with my, with my St. Paul as I am with the gospels, but I'm pretty sure it's in Romans 12. And so they, they took that stuff pretty literally. And if you were a Roman soldier and you became a Christian, pretty much that meant that you had to stop being a Roman soldier. Um, now, part of that was because the Roman soldiers pledged allegiance to to the Roman gods and the Roman emperor. So there was a religious conflict there as well, but there was also a moral conflict. And um, the first saint in the church who was not in the Bible and was not a martyr is St. Martin of Tours. And he originally was a soldier. And when he had his big conversion, he stopped being a soldier. And um, and that, that, that was that was pretty common in the early church when soldiers would convert they would leave the army now after the fall of the roman empire all these like goths and visigoths and and picts and these these various what they called quote unquote barbarian tribes are coming through and and sacking rome and the roman empire is kind of falling apart through the the fourth and fifth and sixth century the people left in charge are largely the church. The bishops often end up being like little princes and little governors of these little areas because there is no other structure. There is, it's, it's a lot of anarchy. Um, and so for the first time, you start finding uh, Christians a little bit had, had happened with Constantine in the 300s. Um, but really for the first time, you start having Christians in authority over large numbers of people being governors. And what do, what do you do if you're a Christian governor and you have the Goths coming through ransacking your city? Um, you know, you're supposed to turn the other cheek. But what does that mean when now there are people under my care and I'm their governor? I'm supposed, I'm the bishop, but I'm also their governor. I'm supposed to protect them, right? Like we have like police and, and that sort of thing. We're supposed to enforce the laws. We're supposed to establish order. So what do we do with that? And so St. Augustine, who is one of the, the great theologians of the early church, he coined terms like original sin and Trinity and other important things like that. He developed this teaching called just war theory. It's basically under what circumstances could you justly, could you nobly, could you justifiably use violence and use force? So, and it breaks into two main categories and my Latin is terrible. So forgive me if I mispronounce this, if you know Latin, uh, the first one is juice ad bellum, meaning justice to war. Basically, this is what you gotta, these are criteria you have to satisfy if you're going to go to war. And then the second one is juice. Let me make sure I'm getting this right. Juice in bello, which is justice in war. So once you are in a war, what tactics can you justifiably use? And this has started in Catholicism, but there's many different practitioners of just war theory and many different permutations. Um, we are going to, uh, stick to the kind of the Catholic version. I'll, I'll give you, I'll give you some other, um, 
some other kind of iterations as as we go through. But we're going to apply these to the first Top Gun movie and the second Top Gun movie and the military situations that they find themselves a part of. So the first thing to recognize is that the church, the Catholic church begins with a strong presumption against the use of force. The church generally is going to say most wars are not morally justified. They're just, they're, I heard someone describe it to me once as going to war to solve a problem is kind of like trying to do surgery with a spoon. It's just a blunt interest instrument and it's going to cause a lot of damage. And so you better be really sure that this surgery is necessary and that you're going to cause less harm by doing the surgery than by not doing it or doing something else. You got to be really sure. Like if, you know, you, if you're going to have a surgery and you only have a spoon, like if it's just to get like a mole removed and it's like not a cancerous mole or something like that, like probably I just live with the mole. Okay. But if it was something that really had to come out, well, I mean, go ahead, use the spoon. It's going to be ugly, but some, sometimes it is justified to use the spoon. So, but generally the church begins with a strong presumption against force. So uh, if you want to look it up in the actual catechism, this is uh, or, uh, paragraphs 2311 and following. And, uh, and that, that's like the main section. So like 20, 2300 around there. All right. So if you're going to go to war, when can you go to war? There are two main criteria uh, that, that you, well, you have to have what's called a just cause. You have to have a justified reason to go to war. Uh, the first one, self-defense. So if somebody attacks you, foreign nation attacks you, you can defend yourself. Uh, the second one would be like humanitarian intervention. So um, one that people point to sometimes is uh, the Iraqi invasion of Kuwait in the early 90s. Okay. You know, Iraq invaded Kuwait. Kuwait couldn't really do much. So the United States and, and uh, other countries uh, came to the defense of Kuwait. Now, there might be other things going on there, but but that in principle, you understand how that could be a humanitarian intervention or if there was genocide going on somewhere, even if you aren't the one being attacked, you could intervene on behalf of someone else. Now, the first one, self-defense, they break this down a little bit um, into three different types. One, a defensive war. So this is responding to an ongoing attack where the damage is lasting, grave, and certain. An ongoing attack where the damage is lasting, grave, and certain. So think about like Pearl Harbor. We got attacked. They're probably going to keep attacking us. It's lasting, grave, and certain. All right. The next one, preemptive war. Striking first to prevent or limit an imminent or certain attack. This we're getting into a little more gray area, but basically the, the idea is, let's say we spotted the Japanese on the way to bomb Pearl Harbor, or when I say we, I mean the United States. We don't have to wait for the first bombs to fall. Like once we figure out that's what they're doing, it's like, oh, this like attack is about to happen. We know that this is going to happen. Um, so there's a little bit of gray area there. Now, what is not justified is what the church calls preventative war, which is striking an enemy to eliminate a potential threat. So uh, back in the, the second Iraq war, back in the early 2000s, there was a lot of discussion about this. Was this a preemptive war? Was it a preventative war? In retrospect, knowing now what we know about weapons of mass destruction that did or didn't exist. Um, so anyway, you see how this gets real gray area real fast. Now, this is something that I find uh, people have a hard time with because they're like, well, what, did the, what does the church say? Is it a just war? Is it not a just war? And with morality and ethics, what the church does is generally it provide. it doesn't give us like a book where it says, you know, and you can like look it up and it's like a math problem with an exact answer where it's like, is this thing wrong? And yes or no. Like there's very few of those things where the church just says in every single case, these things are intrinsically wrong in any and all circumstances. There are some of those, um, torture, killing and killing intentionally, directly killing an innocent person, um, stuff like that. Uh, but generally, the church gives general principles and then says it's the responsibility of each Christian and of, of each society to well form their consciences to apply these principles to the correct contexts, um, especially people that are experts in the field. Um, 
And uh, this is common, really handy in terms uh, of I've, I've heard that, uh, you know, President Kennedy during the Cuban Missile Crisis, when he was deciding, hey, should we start this big war with Russia over this or with the Soviet Union over this? Um, there were, um, you know, he had some advisors who were Catholic and, you know, had studied just war theory that, you know, advised him against going to war with the Soviet Union. That might have helped save the world. You know, it could have been a nuclear holocaust after that. So, so, so who knows? All right. So let's apply this to Top Gun. So the the main mission where they fight with bad guys in the first Top Gun is there is a U.S. ship that is stranded uh, in enemy, like near enemy waters, and so the they send fighter jets out to uh, protect the rescue. And while they're out there, enemy fighters show up and attack them. So. That's self-defense. Satisfies a just cause pretty obviously. Now, in the second, in, in Top Gun Maverick, this is a little more sketchy. And I think probably most people familiar with Just War would say it's probably not justified. But you can tell me what you think in the comments. Um, so in this case, they are attacking a uranium enrichment facility, which is suppo supposedly in violation of international treaty and is going to be used to develop nuclear weapons. And... Um, in the movie, they don't say it's Iran, but it kind of sounds like they're trying to imply that it's Iran, <laughs> like just the way they describe it. Um, so it's not somebody that we're actively at war with, um, but they have various levels of, of, of fighters, some old US stuff, um, some newer Soviet stuff that they've bought, which isn't true exactly but it could i, th I think the the soviets are trying to trying to sell their fanciest jet to people right now so it's it, it's it's possible so basically um they're supposed to attack this uranium enrichment facility and destroy this country's which in the movie they just referred to as like a rogue nation and just destroy this country's ability to develop nuclear weapons now, to me, on the surface, this falls into what we would call preventative war, striking an enemy to eliminate a potential threat. And that is not justified. Now, I think maybe somebody could make an argument that it potentially it was a preventative, a preemptive war, which is striking first to prevent or limit an imminent and certain attack. They said the in the movie that the, the plant was going to go operational within like 10 days. Like, let's say they had made a, a certain threat, like, you know, we're going to wipe this uh, country off the face of the earth or something like that. Like they'd actually like made a threat or we had discovered plans or, or something like that. Um, I think maybe you could make a case um, that this was preemptive war, not preventative war, but I think on the surface, it's probably preventative war. So right there, this would not be a just operation according to uh, Catholic teaching. But let's go through some of the other criteria. So uh, the next criteria is comparative justice. One side is substantially at fault. There's a clear aggressor and a clear victim. Uh, so again, in the first movie, I think that would, you know, the U.S. is clearly the victim who is attacked. You know, they were rescuing uh, their people and they were attacked. In the second movie, it's not as clear. Uh, the next one is that it has to be, uh, the next criteria is that it has to be waged by legitimate authority. It can't just be, you know, you can't just pick up a gun and decide to go start shooting at Mexico, you know, <laughs> no matter how justified you feel, you can't, you can't do that. Um, it has to be a legitimate uh, authority, uh, you know, government, or e even in the, the American Revolutionary War, like there was like a Continental Congress and, um, you know, they, they kind of established a government. So there was some, some amount of legitimate authority to that. Uh, the next criteria is that it has to be done for going to war has to be done with the right intention, meaning that means that the war is solely aimed at resolving the just cause. Okay. So let's say the United States, um, did have a just cause for, let's say attacking Mexico, let's say Max Mexico attacked the United States. And so we had just cause for defending ourselves, but like, while we're defending ourselves and we're like, Hey, you know what we really like? guacamole. So while we're fighting Mexico, we're going to take all their avocados. Like that would be unjust. I know that's kind of a silly, um, uh, you know, example, but that, that's, that's not something that's allowed. There, there was a, a movie with George Clooney and Mark Wahlberg called, um, Oh, what was it called? Three Kings. I think ice, ice cube, ice tea. I always get those guys confused, but, um, was in it as well. But basically it's, it's from, it, it's, it's, fictional, but it's set in the Iraq war, the first Iraq war. And while they're there in Iraq, they're like, are going to steal a bunch of Saddam Hussein's like gold. So that would not be right intention. 
Uh, the next one is probability of success. You have to stand a good chance of resolving the just cause. Now, this really strikes at our American sensibilities because in every movie, it's like, no, even if you're going to lose, you fight to the last man and you never go down and you never surrender because that's what real men do. Uh, but the church says, no, you don't uselessly throw lives away. And so, especially in the second movie, kind of the whole premise of the mission is that it's impossible. Like only Maverick can do it. Like it's a big deal when Maverick shows that like, hey, I'm actually able to do it. And there's a doubt till the very, very end whether anybody else is ever even going to come home. Like they consider it kind of a suicide mission. Um, so, you know, now in the end, they eventually pull it off because of course it's Hollywood. But so that, that would be another way that would probably not be just. Um, the next one is uh, criteria is proportionality, which basically means that uh, th this is the surgery with a spoon thing. So it ha you have to be preventing more harm than you cause. All war causes harm. All, car all war involves great evil, but you have to be preventing more than you cause. So the harm that will be prevented by the war must outweigh the harm that will be caused by, you know, it's interesting when you read the catechism and it gets to just war, it puts the phrase just war in quotes as in, a, as if it's like, you know, so-called just war. Like it doesn't even just want to call it just war. And apparently if you read it in Latin, like that, that sense that it's, it's kind of questioning even the idea that a war can be just, um, comes through even, even stronger. All right. And then the last criteria for uh, can you go to war justifiably is, is this a last resort? Have all nonviolent options been seriously tried and exhausted? Now, they don't really give us enough information in the movie to know this. Um, in, in the first movie, when they're you know rescuing people from a boat and the planes are getting shot at, like at that point, you don't really have nonviolent options to try. You just got to defend yourself. Um, you know, did they try other ways to stop this uranium enrichment plant in the second movie? We don't really know, but you're supposed to have tried all other means. All right, so that is, that is the list of criteria for uh, juice ad bellum. Like, if you're deciding to go to war, you have to satisfy these criteria. The second set of criteria, juice and bellow. If war is justified, a nation is obligated to follow these criteria during war. <clears throat> uh, so this is a quote from the Catechism of the Catholic Church, 2312. The church and human reason both assert that the permanent validity of the moral law during armed conflict, meaning that like ethics and morality don't go away just because you're in war. The mere fact that war has regrettably broken out does not mean that everything becomes illicit between the warring parties. So just because you're at war doesn't mean you can like indiscriminately kill civilians, use torture, nuclear weapons, uh, you know, chemical weapons, that sort of thing. So um, as part of that, there must be non-combatant immunity. You can't intentionally kill civilians or captured soldiers. You can't use weapons of mass destruction that fail to distinguish between combatants and non-combatants. Now, some people argue that like during World War II, where we were using nuclear weapons and also like firebombing, like the firebombing of Dresden and Tokyo, which actually there, there was more people killed in Tokyo with firebombing than there was in Hiroshima or Nagasaki with, with nu nuclear bombs. So th those were just as destructive, although they took a lot more bombs to do it. Um, some people have argued that, you know, those civilians were working in factories and, you know, farming the fields that were going to support the, the Axis war machine. So were they really non-combatants to which the, the counter argument is, well, like, what about like, you know, the children, <laughs> you know, what about the babies in the cradles that were also, also killed? Um, so it's, it's pretty hard to justify, uh, the use of weapons of, of mass destruction under Catholic, um, theology. So some people try to do it, but it's, it's, it's pretty hard to justify. And specifically, um, you know, as, as uh, Catholic teaching on war is one of those things that has developed through the years, you know, Catholic teaching can't flip flop. They can't be like, Oh, this is bad. And now it's good. Oh, this is good. And now it's bad. Like it can't flip flop back and forth, but it can develop and grow over time. So, um, even if you read through the old Testament, like there, it, when we, we tend to think of the old Testament as being pretty violent, but there is a lot of prohibitions on, what sort of violence can be done in the Old Testament. Um, 
And then, you know, with just war theory developing with St. Augustine, St. Thomas Aquinas develops it more and, and other thinkers uh, th through the Middle Ages. Um, and there's a lot of development that happened after World War I, because when World War I hit, everyone was like, whoa, war is different now. There's machine guns, there's artillery, there's airplanes, there's gas, there's all sorts of awful, awful things. And we just didn't know that war could be this awful. And so the church, as, as part of that, um, became much, much more reluctant about war than it had been previously. So um, St. John Henry Newman wrote a lot about the development of doctrine in the church and teaching in the church. And basically said, it's kind of like a, again, it can't flip flop from one thing to another, but it can grow like a tree. So if you think of like the roots of a tree and the trunk of the tree, it can kind of blossom. And that's what's happened with uh, church teaching on war and especially in the 20th century, it's become more reluctant about war and more restrictive on war. All right, so the first of the juice in bello, the, the criteria that have to be satisfied within a war was non-combatant immunity. The second one is, again, proportionality. So um, I, this, again, this idea that you, you're not supposed to use more force than necessary to accomplish a given mission. The harm that you cause must be less than the harm that would have happened by not doing that mission. So this was a criteria for juice ad bellum as well. It's like, it, is the whole war going to cause more harm than good? And this is like, is any individual mission or action going to cause more harm than good? And then again, uh, this idea of right intention. Are you, we, we talked about this before. Are you going to war to justify the just cause or to, to rectify the just cause? Or are you really going to war for some other reason? You're just kind of using this cause as a, as a, as a side justification. Each mission must also do the same thing. So, um, sorry, George Clooney and Mark Wahlberg. You can't go steal Saddam Hussein's gold. <laughs> All right, so let's apply these to the Top Gun movies. Non-combatant immunity, in both cases, they're they are dogfighting. Um, there is no non-combatants. Now, you could argue in the second movie, they're destroying an underground bunker that's for uranium enrichment. Would there be some innocent people in there? Potentially. Are they, you know, what are they using the uranium for? Is it just for weapons? Is it also for uh, nuclear power, something like that. So are there like scientists inside that are innocent? Um, so you, you could argue that they have not, um, you know, they, uh, they haven't satisfied non-combatant immunity. Now that could be, you know, you could strike a legitimate military target like a uranium enrichment facility and unintentionally kill civilians so that would fall under something called the principle of double effect where sometimes when something causes a good co a good effect and a bad effect um is sometimes it can be justified uh, the the negative bad effect can be justified so some people might might argue that 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 was still okay all right proportionality did they use more force than necessary to accomplish any given mission doesn't seem like in either case that they did uh right intention each mission must serve to resolve the just cause it seems like in both cases <clears throat> they are in fact um you know they're fighting dog fighting bombing this uh uranium enrichment facility for the right reasons all right so that is a brief rundown of the criteria for just war theory and how it applies to Top Gun. Now, I promised you at the beginning of this episode that you would have some things to take with you and put into your own life on how to know God's love better and how to live it better. So what's the gospel challenge? How can we incorporate this? It does kind of seem philosophical. It does kind of seem abstract. What does Jesus tell us? Jesus tells us that blessed are the peacemakers. Blessed are the peacemakers. He tells us to be people of peace. One of Jesus's names is the Prince of Peace. Many people expected the Messiah when he came to be like Moses throwing plagues on the Egyptians, like King David cutting the heads off of Philistines, like Judas Maccabeus kicking the Greeks out of the temple. They're like Joshua, you know, killing Canaanites left and right. A lot of people expected the Messiah to be like that. And there were other false messiahs claiming to be the Messiah who were doing stuff like that. Um, Barabbas in the gospel is the famous example. But Jesus chose a different sort of Messiah, a prince of peace, who said the real enemy is not the Romans or the, the Babylonians or the, the Persians or any of the other great empires that the, the Jews had struggled with. The real enemy is sin. 
And Jesus does things like making, you know, hanging out with Samaritans, using Samaritans as examples in his parables, healing Roman centurion servants. He reached out to those who were enemies. Jesus flips the script. He changes the game when it comes to violence. Yes, war can sometimes be justified. Yes, the use of force can sometimes be justified. But as Christians, our primary call is to be people of peace. And that starts within. We must be people of peace within, letting go of hatred, letting go of resentment, forgiving, which is hard. We've talked about that a lot on this show. Forgiveness is hard. And it doesn't always mean that you let go of all your boundaries that you've set with people who are dangerous. Like sometimes you have to keep some firm boundaries in place with people that are hurting you. But that doesn't mean you have to hold on to that hate in your heart. And so my take home message for you today, my gospel takeaway, is perhaps think about the people in your life where in your heart there is some violence. In your heart there is some war towards them. And and maybe it doesn't change your relationship with them. Maybe it does, maybe it doesn't. But let's take that to prayer and invite Christ into those conflicts within our own hearts. Invite him in. Maybe we need to go to confession. Maybe we need to go to mass. Maybe we need to just spend some time in prayer or read the scriptures. Invite Christ into those conflicts. Saying, Lord, I want your peace. I Give me your peace. I want it. I want to know how to forgive. I want to know how to move past this. And even though I don't feel it, I choose, Lord. I choose to take the next step. Uh, somebody once told me that that forgiveness is like having this block of ice in your chest. And it to melt that ice, you need to bring it out into the sun. But it doesn't happen all at once. It happens like 1% or 2% at a time. And we have to make this frequent choice to bring that block of ice out and let God melt it a little bit at a time and say, I choose to forgive. I choose to forgive. I choose to forgive. And that doesn't mean what the person did was okay. It doesn't mean that I'm necessarily even going to change. Like I said, it doesn't mean I have to let that person back into my life or interact with them again. Perhaps reconciliation is possible, that, but that, that takes two people. But forgiveness just takes you and God. And it starts first with our will, choosing to let God into that dark place. And eventually our heart begins to soften and come around and we can, we can emotionally and psychologically let go. But that only comes with time. So that's my takeaway for you is to invite Christ into those warring parts of our hearts. Thank you so much, dear listeners, for going on me with this little bit of a nerdy journey through uh, just War Theory and Top Gun, and I hope you have enjoyed it. We're going to close with prayer in a second, but before we do that, I want to tell you about our show, Pop Culture Catechism. You can support it by going to popculturecatechism.com. We are one of eight shows on the Awakening Catholic Network, and uh, we are supported by listeners like you. You can go to popculturecatechism.com and become a patron. There are six tiers of giving that you can do to support this show. Um, and you can choose one that, um, you know, has the perks that you like, but also fits your budget and fits your tithe. Um, and the, with that, you get access to lots of exclusive content through the Awaken Catholic app, which is a free app. But those of you who are patrons get access. Uh, of, uh, if you're a patron on one of the show, you get access to lots of exclusive stuff. Um, like I mentioned before, for this episode, every episode has exclusive content. For this episode, uh, you're going to have access to all my lectures on uh, Christian history of, of war and pacifism and nonviolence and nonviolent conflict resolution uh, and just war as well. It's about four or five lectures, about 20 minutes each. You'll have access to all of those. So um, that's for this episode. But also you get access to all my talks that I give in my speaking ministry. Um, I put all those up there and also uh, lots of stuff uh, like we did, we did a initiative for Lent this year. So lots of other stuff that happens through Awakening Catholic uh, is only available to patrons. So you get access to all that as well. Now, even if you're not a patron, you can still download the Awaken app and there's a great Christian community on there, almost 2000 strong now, as well as a Christian prayer library in three languages, English, Latin, and Spanish, and a Christian music library, which is cool as well. So I definitely encourage you to become a patron of the show um, and to check out the Awaken app. I want to give a quick shout out to our patrons, Carl and Melissa Gore, uh, Lisa and Bob Tenney, Maggie and Steve Hubbard, and Emily and Tom Camberiati, and to all our patrons uh, who support us through popculturecatechism.com. 
gmail.com. Let's end in prayer. So wherever you are, take a moment, unless you're driving, you you know, close your eyes, take a breath. Remember that God is good. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen. Good and gracious God, we thank you for being our Prince of Peace. Thank you, Jesus. And we pray for those who live with violence, those places in the world that are marked by violence, that are uh, marked by unjust aggression, uh, especially the most innocent victims, the most vulnerable victims, Lord, we ask that you protect them, that you help us to know as a society and as a world how we can best be people of peace, how we can protect those who need protection. Uh, we ask you to, to watch over all of those in our arms armed services and armed forces, um, guide the leadership of our country and of our armed forces, uh, guide their hearts and guide all our hearts, Lord. And we ask that you would release us from the hurts that we have received, release us from violence, release us from hatred, give us the grace to choose forgiveness and in time to even feel forgiveness, Lord. We place our hearts in your hands and we ask for your peace. Amen. In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Thank you listeners for going on this journey with us. Feel free to tell us your favorite parts of the movie or any thoughts that you have in the comments and we will see you next time.